From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week as we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Or I guess maybe I should welcome myself back. Uh I am back and um, so super excited to be here and to focus exclusively on this podcast alongside coaching, of course. But I want to use this platform to start sharing with you the kinds of things I'm seeing on my end. This is in part what I want to do anyway. Um, Things that are going on in modern marriages as well as in the dating world. I'm even going to incorporate some of the material from the course I was working on before I decided not to finish that and to return to this podcast. So that content is actually still going to be accessible. I'm basically just restructuring the way I'm doing things, I guess is a better way of putting it. And I want to talk about what I've learned. Something I should say something that I've learned over the years that has become my sweet spot in terms of clientele. And that is that Women around the age of 30 tend to be the folks who find me. Um, That's what we're going to talk about today and why and how to sort of keep that from happening where these women who are coming to find me are really trying to course correct. So they essentially... We're not set up to succeed in life and in love the way they were set up to succeed in their career. They weren't prepared for what was going to happen. The culture certainly didn't do it. And in many, many cases, their parents didn't. So that's when they start to Google because they're frustrated, right? And they end up finding me and, and reach out for coaching. I'm, let me just talk about this for a second. First of all, it's, it's, it's difficult, but very doable to reverse course and to get things right in this arena, no matter what age you're at. But obviously it's much better and easier to know in advance how to make smart decisions about your personal life. So that's essentially what I'm going to end up focusing on today. So I just want to make it clear that while that's, that those are my, those are mostly my clients, they're either married or single And they've just been walloped with this life that no one prepared them for. No one. And so that's what this podcast episode is going to be about. And then we're going to get into the, to the six reasons in the why we should course correct, I should say, and reverse the way we do things. Um, The way women, I should say young women are taught to do things. Uh, Really quickly before I do that, though, I just want to alert you to another podcast because it's very similar to this one. And I, I'm very confident that if you love the Suzanne Venker show, you're also going to love this one. It's called Being Different. I think there's more than one called Being Different, but this is with Liz Durham, D-U-R-H-A-M, and it's new. I'm going to actually have Liz on sometime in the near future because she's essentially a great example of what I'm talking about with um having confronted this, this world that she's now in and has such strong feelings about, and she was just sort of walloped. And, and so a lot of the content that she is going to put out is is similar to what I do. Um, so I just wanted to alert you guys to that so that you could go over there and sign up and subscribe to her podcast, being different with Liz Durham. Okay, moving on. So one of the questions I've I've heard and what I imagine people thinking when I talk about marrying younger or prioritizing love is that, Hey, Suzanne, you married at 23 and you got divorced four years later. So I would think you would not be a proponent of prioritizing love or getting married young. So I want to begin by explaining first what I mean by young. I think that's super important. The data show The divorce rate is higher if you marry younger than age 25. So between 18 and 25, it, your, your divorces, your, sorry, your chances of divorce go up. Now you have to be realistic about this and understand that obviously an 18, 19, 20, 21 year old is going to struggle more 
than say a 24 year old. So you got to take these numbers with a grain of salt. I mean, it's just a generalization. The point is that the closer you can get to 25, the better. So when I talk about marrying younger or youngish or prioritizing that part of your life, I'm not really a big, huge proponent of marrying before 25. So when I say young, I'm saying somewhere around 25, which can be 24, can be 26, just generally around 25. I think the closer you can get to that, the better. And obviously if you, if you have stats on divorce, why not move, you know, why not get us, give yourself the best leg up that you can with that information. So, um, that doesn't mean I'm against somebody who gets married at 23, which is what I did. Um, and and assume that they're going to automatically get divorced. That's just silly. So I want to quickly just sort of give that description of what I mean by young. And then also really quickly explain the reason for my divorce. It was not about age per se, although I'm quite certain my ex-husband would disagree with that. He would probably say that, but I always knew it was much deeper than that. In our case, there was a real real disconnect between our values and our priorities and in our choice of lifestyle. So that kind of killed it. If you, if you agree on the four main pillars of marriage, this is what the data show on this as well, i.e. kids, when to have them, how to parent them, money, religion, and in-laws, meaning what, how to handle your respective families and what their role is going to be in your life, your life as a married couple, you have a high probability of having a successful marriage. And this is true regardless of age. So he and I did not have those four or several, just certainly did not have several of them. That was the bigger issue, not what the chronological age is. So I want to get those two things out of the way. What I mean by marrying young or younger and what the real issue is when it comes to why some of those earlier marriages fail. But that's just my story. As far as the average young woman who's in a relationship today goes, they are dealing with something much different than I did, which is the cultural and parental pressure to potentially end those relationships or at least put them on the back burner solely due to their age. The idea being that career should come first and be the focus of your life and that love should be worried about later. That's what I'm talking about. Not my story, but that message that comes both from the culture and from, I would say, almost most parents. This is what cause, this is what, that message, that narrative is what causes those women who reach out to me around the age of 30 to wish they hadn't listened, to wish they had done things differently. And so in the ideal world, I'd love to, to catch women before 30, um, So they're not in that boat and they don't have to call me again, not because you can't course correct at 30. You absolutely can. You can course correct at 40, 50, 60. I I believe anything is doable if your mindset is right. If you've got the right mindset. Um, But I, I do like the idea of giving people a leg up and I feel like I was given a leg up. I feel like I pass it on to my kids. I feel like that whole cold countercultural messaging that many parents do, I'm certainly not the only one. I'd love it to become the norm because I truly believe, well, I know we would be so much better off if we did. Um, Okay. So as it happens, interestingly enough, Pew Research released a report just several weeks ago. I'm looking at it right now. It's from January 24th and it's, the title is Parenting in America Today. And the finding that they, the main finding that they released was about mental health concerns, which of course it should be. That is a massive problem. We're not going to talk about that today. Um, But if you scroll down further, you find what for me was an even more jarring, at least, you know, it interested me because of what I do. Um, Statistics or a chart. There's a chart here. There's an actual chart here that's called Parents Prioritize Financial Stability job satisfaction for their children when they reach adulthood. And there's a list of five things here that you would potentially as a parent be interested in for your adult children in terms of their goals for you, you know, what your goals are for them. Be financially independent, 
have careers they enjoy, get a college degree, and get married and have children. Those are five things. You are not going to believe the stark, or maybe you will, the stark contrast that you will see in the top um, graph. The top two, financially independent and have careers they enjoy, 88 is 88 percent. Juxtapose that with what they with the numbers for getting married and have children. Getting married and having children. Twenty percent. I mean, really let that sink in. Eighty-eight percent to twenty percent. If there was ever proof of our misplaced priorities of the past several decades that parents have been passing on to their children, this is it. There was an article in The Atlantic about this finding in Pew called America's Fever of Work of Workaholism is Finally Breaking by Derek Thompson. And he writes in there, quote, These surveys suggest that everything society ought to consider bigger than work, family, faith, love, relationships, along with ethics and kindness, he adds, turn out to be secondary. The message from American parents seems to be, your career is up here, Everything else is down there, end quote. Now, you all know if you've been listening to this podcast or followed anything else I've done over the years, this is the exact pot I've been banging. So I am happy to return to the Suzanne Banker Show with this topic, since it's honestly the underpinning of everything that I preach. I mean, let's face it, America screwed up. There's really no other way to explain it. We switched gears for what we thought was a good reason at the time which is essentially to allow women who were at one point in time bogged down with babies and childcare and didn't have a lot of opportunity to do life outside of that. And it was understandable. It felt right at the time. That was many, many moons ago. (laughs) Much has happened. And the truth is we overcorrected. Rather than help women find a way to incorporate work and family into their lives over the long haul in a way that works for everybody, their children, their marriages themselves. We encouraged a mass exodus of mothers from the home. And then from there, we began to teach the bogus concept of sexual equality, which suggests or teaches that men and women are the same. And in so doing, we groomed women to put education and career first and to just worry about love and family later. If you even do that at all, marriage is like, it's just an afterthought. So what's the problem with that, you might ask? And here we go back to what I said at the beginning, which is that most women change dramatically around the age of 30 and begin to view the world and their place in it very differently. It's at this stage of life where they begin to count out the next five years with respect to their fertility and what they want for their futures which in my opinion is not the time is too late. It's not too late. Like I said, you can course correct, but it's not the time to do that. The time to do that was 10 years earlier, in my opinion. And this could have been avoided. So the, it's fact, it's the people who think long-term who pan out and really map things out better and think more critically about this, who end up winning in the end. And we're not teaching women to do that. I mean, we all know that, Somewhere around the age of 30, a woman starts to, the average woman, most women, not all women. I feel like I always have to say that now to just, you know, for that caveat. I'm generalizing. I'm a, I'm a generalizer. It's okay. Most women are going to start counting, okay, well, let's see if I meet someone now. It's going to take several years to develop that relationship. Okay, then we have to decide whether or not to get married, plan the wedding. That takes up to a year. Um, okay, then... We need, you know, some time to be together. And then, then we start thinking about having children. And then, I don't know, I could have a miscarriage in there. And by the time I actually have, what, two or three children or whatever you want, you're starting to think, oh my God, I'm going to be too close to 40. This is what goes on in the mind of the average 30-year-old woman. We know this. This is, not, this is, this is, this is in her, this is in her DNA. This has nothing to do with society. This is who she is at her core. There's no reason to have to live that way. There's no reason to have to have that stress. 
Not to mention the fact that when you are up against the clock like that, your choice of a mate, we're going to get into this later, is going to be um, um, clouded by that other, that by that time clock and that desire that you have to have, you know, hurry up and have a family or what have you. So you're looking at the whole dating world very differently than you would have, you know, eight years earlier. Of course, men don't have this thing when they hit 30. It doesn't happen to them for obvious reasons, thus proving that the equality message was crap. Men and women may appear to be the same when they're in their 20s, but their seemingly similar identities, you know, going to work, living on your own, you know, just doing life, it begins to change over time. That's why it was a mistake to overcorrect and tell women to use their 20s to have fun and find themselves and to worry about marriage later. Women's 20s are essentially wasted on this narrative. There was a great book by Meg Jay called The Defining Decade, Why Your 20s Matter. If you guys want to check that out, great book. She also did a um, TED Talk on that exact topic that did extremely well. And it will really shift the way you think about the 20s and that entire decade It really fights back against that narrative of, ah, go out and travel the world and find yourself and worry about marriage later. It's a completely different take on on how to view the 20s, which obviously I love and um, respect. So I'm passing that on if you want to take a look at that. Okay, so in this same vein, I'm now going to list six super solid reasons or why women should start prioritizing love over career. Number one, it is significantly easier, at least for women, and that's what I'm focusing on for this episode, to find a partner, to find a husband. There is no sexual equality in mating. That's just the way it is. As men get older, they become more desirable, typically, and that's not the case for women, typically. And we know this from the data that shows that women still search for security in their mating choices, even if they are perfectly capable, as most of us are, of taking care of ourselves, that has nothing to do with the fact that when it comes time to have children, you're going to want options. And the only way to have that option, those options, is to find a viable working um, partner. If you were to ask the average man what they're looking for in a wife, they're not going to say a woman with a great job. That, that's just not the answer they're going to give. And if it is the answer they're going to give, you want to run because that's not what the average guy should be looking for in a woman. Unless, you know, you're talking about somebody who doesn't want to have a family, then then you might get a different answer. But if you're looking for a fa- to have a family, you're not looking for a woman who's going to provide for you. The average man, even if it may appear because it's very topsy turvy today, and women and men are struggling with um, their goals, financial goals, for a whole lot of reasons. Um, that's regardless of what it looks like. That's what most men want, and so as women get older, their sexual market value declines. Men are always going to be drawn to a very feminine, attractive, sweet woman who is maternal and nurturing if he's looking for a wife that's that's just not going to change that's what they would look for naturally at their core and a woman's going to look for security and that that just goes back eons and doesn't change just because women are now capable of taking care of themselves number two women are going to have far fewer if any fertility problems. That's the second reason. Okay. These, these first two are huge, by the way. I mean, there's more, I'm going to do the whole six, but these first two are by themselves huge. You're going to struggle to find a partner later and you're going to have more fertility problems. Imagine if you could get two of those completely out, knocked out, like you don't have those issues at all. It's just the years of pain and heartache. Um, in, in avoiding that fertility problems have obviously become massive and they are a result of exactly what I'm talking about 
which is prioritizing career over love and family so that you are so honed in on money and career that you are um, testing, you know, your biology and seeing it, how, how, how far out you can push uh, having children and, and our bodies are reacting and saying, Hey, we, we don't want to do this at 35, 38, 40. That's not what we want to do if your body could talk. So why would you want to create problems for yourself when you could do it the natural way? Number three, this is a really big one that I don't think, well, I know is never discussed. It is significantly easier to make life decisions about career and geography, money, um, where to live, well, the geography is where to live, as opposed to getting stuck later on when you're trying to mesh your life with someone else's. So in other words, if you're starting out and you're focused on love and family being your focus, right? You want to get married, you want to have a family. Obviously, your mind is going to be, it, you're going to focus on the dating experience in a very different way than you would 10 years down the line. It's going to be the focus of every other decision. <clears throat> So if you're taking it seriously and looking when your sexual market value is highest, and then you start thinking about all these other things in your life that you want, well, here's what I want my life to look like. Here's where I want to live. Here's the kind of career that would work well long-term with marriage and motherhood, that kind of stuff. You'll be able to incorporate those alongside someone else who's on the same page, if you're getting this right at the beginning than you ever will be able to do 10 years down the road because you're going to be stuck in this mode and these decisions that you've made. And then you're going to have to try to incorporate someone else's entire life that he's created. Often that comes along with a lot of stuff, um, even children from a previous relationship or marriage um, and careers. And, um, um, and again, going back to geography, how, how to resolve where you're going to live. Um, all of these things that have become huge factors in modern relationships did not exist 40, 50 years ago, obviously, when when women were more focused on getting married first or earlier. So, uh, you know, again, I don't think we talk about the minutia of how difficult it is to mesh one's life with someone else later, but that's a huge factor as well. So, so far, I've given you three massive things and we're not even done yet. Number four, more relationships more broken relationships, I should say, equals more baggage. More broken relationships equals more baggage. That's just common sense. So by the time you end up getting married, you have this long relationship history that I think we think is just no big deal. Like that's just normal. It's okay to get together with someone and break up over and over. Well, yeah, that might've worked back in my mother's day. She dated around a lot. <laughs> before she married my father. But there's a key difference here. They weren't having sex. So if you were dating someone casually, which is not a thing anymore, well, I mean, the the hooking up is a thing, but that's not dating. That's just having sex. Back in my mother's day, you actually dated around casually, like went out on several dates. They were light and you determined whether or not there was a match. So you could actually see several people at once if you do it that way, right? And I know that's not the way it's it's done today, but I'm saying um, that's not, because it's not done that way anymore, the relationships that people are having are long and involved and sexual, and sometimes you're even living with them, and then it's ending. And it's not just once, it's two times, three times, four times. By the time you get married, in fact, again, data even shows that the more relationship history you have, the more relationship baggage, the harder your relationship, your, the harder your marriage is going to be and the less successful it will be. So if you're not going to get married around 25 and you're going to wait till you're in your 30s, what do you think is going to happen throughout that, throughout those years? You're, you're basically encouraging people to just be really good at breaking up and loss. And in other words, you're teaching them how not to commit with this idea that when they do commit, somehow they're just going to magically know how to do it. <laughs> right. But that's not going to work because your history and your experience has actually been in the, in the loss, not the commitment. I don't know. I just think that's 
really interesting that we just don't even consider this when we tell women to just worry about love later. Number five, another huge one that gets literally no attention. The help from grandparents and extended family that you are less likely to have when you settle down with kids, the older you are when you get married and have kids. This is a, um, this is personal for, for at least for my daughter, because my mother was, she married and had kids very late in life. And, um, my kids and my mother were very close. We were together a lot when they were young, but then she died in 2015 when they were still young. And it was, it's very sad and it's very unfortunate. And it's not until you're like in that boat that you realize, wow, I really wish I had done this differently because I, that grandparent and grandchild relationship is so crucial. Um, number one and number two, so helpful to the mom while you're home with kids or even whether you're home or not. I mean, just the grandparents are so helpful when you have children. Um, and so the, the, the older you are, the less likely you're going to have that in your life. And that's a tremendous loss. Um, and so the earlier you get married, the more chance that you will have those grandparents around for the long haul. So again, very personal in my family, um, maybe not in yours, but, and so maybe you haven't thought about it, but it's not until you don't experience it that you really kind of pay attention maybe. Okay. And the last one, um, and I'm going to enlist my podcast producers experience as we speak. Kelsey, you guys have heard me talk about Kelsey. I still have Kelsey. I wouldn't have anybody else. She just had a baby and, um, wow. Okay. So this is <laughs> number six. You you'll skip the whole transition to wife and motherhood from years of living solo and for yourself. <laughs> so Kelsey is 34 and she is struggling with the, as most women are today, she's not unusual in the slightest with the whole transition to sacrificial motherhood. I mean, that's, a, I mean, that's a redundant phrase. That's what motherhood is. It is a, a life of sacrifice for X amount of years. When you've spent 10 years having all your needs met, you know, doing what you want according to your own schedule, um, everything's a click away. I mean, it's just a whole different life that you've lived. And then you go into motherhood mode is very, very difficult. Um, very difficult. And no one, no one talks about that. It's, 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 it's th there's a way to avoid that. Obviously, if you don't, if, if you hadn't prioritized career for 10 years, or if you don't, then you won't have this long history of, of living life this way. So it won't be as jarring when you make that transition. Again, all these things are doable. Nothing is not doable if it's not done the way I'm suggesting. It's just your course correcting. And it's very, very difficult. And I'm saying, why go through that? Why send the message that's causing so much pain for women? That's my point. No, not everybody's going to be able to do it this way, but that doesn't mean that you can't groom uh, young women with a different narrative. That's all I'm saying. We're giving up all these viable, all these, these six things that I just described. We're giving all of that up in this name, in the name of finding ourselves. That's been the narrative. That's the message to women. And it's a false one anyway, because it takes humans decades to find themselves or to discover who they really are at their core. It's a process and a journey that can happen just as easily while being married. It's not an either or situation. So the narratives, the narrative, the reason for the narrative is false to begin with. In fact, I would argue that you're less likely to find yourself on your own by yourself. You have to actually be in a relationship and deal with the natural conflict that occurs in order to improve yourself. It's in this struggle or the back and forth of living with someone day in and day out that forces a person to look in the mirror and really deal with themselves. I mean, just living by yourself endlessly for years, just, it just doesn't work that way. You don't just think yourself into, you know, th think for years and travel around and then 
one day you just, oh, I found myself. It just doesn't work that way. In fact, I would argue that you are less likely to find yourself on your own because you have to actually be in a relationship and deal with the natural conflict that occurs within that relationship in order to improve yourself. It's in that struggle or that, or that, you know, back and forth of living with someone day in and day out and dealing with um, the things that come up that forces a person to look in the mirror and deal with things. Just being by yourself isn't, isn't going to do it. So that's it. Those are my six super solid reasons for women to start prioritizing love over career. And if you are someone who is beyond the twenties, that's okay because I'm sure you have a, an adult daughter slash friend or family member or somebody who can benefit from it. So hopefully, um, you pass it all along to them. Thanks guys. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker show. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and to leave us a review as well as share this episode with a friend. As always, you may reach me with any questions or comments at Suzanne at the Suzanne show.com. And if you would like to support this podcast, which would be very much appreciated, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash the Suzanne Banker show. Thanks everyone. Have a good week. Mm-hmm.